The Entrepreneur's Library, episode 118. Welcome to the Entrepreneur's Library, the only book-centric podcast that reviews all the top-selling business books and shares authors' perspective firsthand. This is your resource to finding the next great book that will enable you to grow personally and professionally. Welcome your host, Wade Danielson. Thank you for joining us on the Entrepreneur's Library. Today we have David Burkus, author of The Myths of Creativity, the truth about how innovative companies and people generate great ideas. And this is one of my favorite interviews um, that I've done as of late. David does a great job of not only breaking down his book, but um, really I I can tell, you know, we asked that question about paradigm shifts, uh, you know, when we have them recommend a book, but he does a a phenomenal job of of breaking down some of the myths. And and I have no doubt you'll want to jump right into his book after you get done with this interview. So without further ado, let's bring on David. Welcome, David. And thank you for joining us on the Entrepreneur's Library. Thank you so much for having me. Will you take just a moment before we take a deep dive into your book to introduce yourself and tell us just a little bit about you personally? Yeah. So uh, my name is Dave Burkus. still. Uh, I'm the author of, actually, let me, let me back up. Uh, I'm the husband to one wife and father to two kids, but I'm also the author of a, of a third kid, uh, The Myths of Creativity, which is a book about creativity and innovation and sort of what the outstandingly creative companies know that presumably non-creative companies uh, haven't figured out yet, we'll say. And my, my goal is to help them figure that out. And then uh, I also, when I'm not in airport lounges on my way to talk about the book, I'm in the classroom. Uh, I teach at Oral Roberts University. I'm a professor of management here. Um, trying to, let's say, let's say do the same thing that I'm trying to do with companies, but do it to the upcoming generation so that I work myself out of a job and get to switch to some other topic. That's awesome. I love how you brought it up that you had uh, the the third child, the third baby, the the book. Because I I usually a lot of times when I sign off, that's what I say. Hey, thank you so much for sharing your your baby, your book with us. You know, because it really is. There's so much time and effort that goes into producing uh, for for those that produce quality. You know, uh, there's so much time and effort that goes into it. So I, I thought that was awesome. But thank you for sharing that. Right. And now let's jump right into that book that we were just talking about, the myths of creativity which was just made available for purchase not too long ago, about a year, October 2013. And Dave, we're going to move quickly, but we're going to cover the top questions that our listener slash reader wants to get answered. And the first one is, what was the inspiration behind writing The Myths of Creativity? Yeah, so the um, the inspiration, it's kind of an interesting serendipitous story, if you will. I did not set out to write a book about creativity and innovation. Um, I, I'm a leadership guy in my background. I, I did uh, I have a master's degree in organizational psychology, graduate degree in strategy and leadership. I And I wanted to know, my, this is actually my doctoral dissertation question, I, I wanted to know what do the leaders of those admirably creative companies do differently than leaders of you know, well, presumably non-creative companies. It's a terrible term for reasons we'll get to in a little bit. But um, you know, the, the regular companies, the ones that the soul draining ones that make all of us feel like we're in a cube form. What, what are these other leaders doing differently? Right. So what are your apples and Googles and Pixar's and all that doing differently? And, and it's a really interesting question because it's easy to see now. It's easy to compare Pixar to some other film company now and point out the differences. But if you really uh, if you want to control your answers and understand what they did to get where they are, um, that's a much harder question to do. And, and I couldn't, uh, to be honest with you, I couldn't solve it, right? If you look at the early days of the company, the difference between why some grow into Googles and Apples and Pixars and why others with uh, equal resources uh, don't became less and less about the actions of any individual leader. As, as much as we'd love to tell stories about Steve Jobs and Ed Catmull and Sergey Brin and all of that sort of thing, um, a lot of the success isn't necessarily attributed to specific actions that they took, et cetera. It actually comes down to beliefs that they have about themselves, beliefs that they have about their people or that their people have about themselves, rather than any of the given resources or talents or skills that they have. And so this was the idea, um, <clears throat> this was the idea behind the myths thing, right? Myths are stories that we tell that shape our worldview, shape the way that we perceive the world. They're not our talent, skills, and abilities, but they're how we see our those things playing out into the world in front of us. And as we know, perception is reality. So it became about that. If, if this is the only difference, the way that people describe the creative process, right? Some people call it mysterious and vague and other people call it, you know, a, a process. It's just a simple thing that we all sort of have. And those differences in perception really made a difference. And so that became the inspiration for the book is let's explore where are there differences in perception around the role of creativity in, in organizations? And where uh, is where do, what does the psychology research say? And where do those discrepancies really make a difference? And so that's the sort of the idea for 
for the book as a whole. So Dave, we, we talked about this a little bit before we jumped on here, and, and that was that there's tons of books that come out every single month. We're inundated with, with, uh, with content, some of it fantastic, some of it not so great. So we take this opportunity to really differentiate your book from others out there that have the same or similar topic. Yeah, I mean, cre- creativity is a, is a great example of that. There are, there's a lot. I tried to read them all. It's impossible. There's a lot of books about creativity. I'm staring at my shelf right now. I have two whole shelves in my bookshelf on just creativity books. And if I look at mine versus a lot of them, not every single one of them, but mine versus a lot of them, most of them are, here's how to have more great ideas. Right. Most of them are books about here are techniques to use. In fact, most of them have the word technique or something like it in the subtitle or ac- exercises, activities. Most of them are all around like how do you make brainstorming more effective, for example. Um, and I am taking a step even further back and saying that like it, all of none of that stuff matters unless we address some of the fundamental beliefs that you or people on your team have about their ability to tap into their creative side. And there's a lot fewer books that that do that, that say, what are the, what are the stories that you're telling yourself and are they helping you? And if not, what, what do we need to correct so that all of these books on about techniques and whatever can work? If we, if you just read a bunch of books about technique, but you don't change your worldview about the role creativity and innovation plays in building a company or leading a great team, then all of those books on techniques are going to be useless. And that's probably why they're, it's like diet books, right? That's probably why there are so many of them because you're finding them useless. The reason is you need to take a step back and look at your worldview. So David, how do you recommend or suggest the reader engage with your book? Is this one they can jump in and out of as they need different information? Or is this really one you designed to be read from front to back? I mean, I would love it if you read it front to back. Uh, um, I will tell you, I think that you could you could jump in and out of it, but only if you read the first chapter first, right? So the, the way that the book is structured... Um, the first one deals with this worldview sort of concept and correcting, and then each chapter is a different myth. And so if you wanted, you could dive in and out of those sort of myths um, as long as you sort of read that base one first. But this is definitely not one of those books that you could also just read the first three chapters and get like the basic idea, which I feel like most business books are are read. So yeah, jump in and out of it if you want. Better yet, uh, you know, Better yet, read the entire thing. Better, I mean, better yet, listen to this on the podcast, read the entire thing, then send me any questions you have to jump out of it even further and even deeper, right? So there oh, you that's go. That's perfect. You know, I've heard what you were just talking about. That I've, I've heard that that's a strategy among some authors is that they front load. Um, and many of that's because they've re- realized that readers, uh, you know, are, aren't very committed sometimes. So they front load and really put a ton of their best content in those first couple, like you were saying, the first three chapters. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is so in a in a in a from a business of publishing standpoint, this is a pet peeve of mine, right? Because the idea is, oh, the average reader only reads uh, the first three chapters, so put all your good stuff in the first three chapters, and and that's true. But it could also be that the average reader only reads the first two chapters because all of the good stuff is only in the. <laughs> so uh, my thought is like, why design? I mean, I, I, you, I think you know, in a Kindle world where everybody can preview the thing, I think you want to have uh, the first chapter or two, which is what my book does, set the stage for this is what we'll be discussing over the next two hundred and twenty pages, mm. and give people enough to make a decision about whether to lead further into the book. But at the same time, I, at page two hundred and ten, I still want you to be learning new stuff. Otherwise, why are you? on that page why haven't you closed the book a long time ago right so um so yeah i think it's a chicken and the egg problem and i would rather give you 220 pages of good stuff than condense it all down to the first part so david we're my favorite part of the entire interview and that's where as a book lover i love to hear about a book before i actually purchase i love to to know um is this the book that's going to help me move either you know forward either personally or professionally and so will you take the next you know five eight ten minutes and really take a deep dive into what your book's all about. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, and I can and I can tell. By the way, those are the you that are listening or reading. I can tell this is his favorite question because he sent me the list of six questions, and this one is in bold. Um, so <laughs> clearly, this one is the most important. Um, so I, I begin with this premise, and you know what's funny is is a book. Um, a book is never finished. The idea behind a book is never finished. A book is like a snapshot in time of like, here's what I was thinking in 2012, 2013 about this issue. But then you put put it out there and you interact with new people who have read it and they give you their ideas. And there's a phrase that I wish I would have heard before, or I wish I would have figured out how to phrase it before I published the book, but I didn't. And so I start most of my talks with this because uh, it didn't get into the book. And it's this, the stories that we tell ourselves are true, even if they're not true. 
The stories that we tell ourselves are true, even if they're not true, even if they're totally false, even if they have no basis in reality, even if they're half true, whatever, the more you tell yourself that story, the more it becomes true. And in psychology, this is actually a theory. This is called confirmation bias. And the confirmation bias sort of theory says that we selectively filter in or filter out information depending on how it confirms our pre-existing way of looking at the world, right? So easy examples, uh, we just went through an election season in the United States and I have about, uh, you know, maybe 50-50, it's probably 60-40 friends of different political persuasions on Facebook, right? And it's really funny because if you hold one persuasion, you look at a friend that has a different persuasion and you just think they're ridiculous. How could they even believe that, right? Um, clearly, they're, they have confirmation bias and they're just looking at the world through this lens of R or D, right? Uh, and then, of course, you get this real conviction that like, well, wait a minute, I'm looking at them that way because I have the same bias, right? So uh, the, the stories that we tell ourselves are true even if they're not true because they become true. And in the case of creativity, this is sort of like what we were talking about earlier. This is that worldview piece. There are stories people tell themselves about creativity, how it works, how to have more of it that limit them. And the difference between outstandingly creative companies and people and presumably people who don't have the same level of creative output, the non-creatives, although I hate that term because everybody has this potential. There's just output versus non-output. So the people who aren't don't have the same level of creative output, they're the ones that will usually say things like um, – that creativity is vague and mysterious or, or we'll say things like my favorite is people will say it just came to me, right? The idea just came to me. Oh, oh really? Well, where was the idea before? And do you know where it's headed? I'd love to meet it off to the past and take it, right? <laughs> um, this idea that it came from, I mean, and, and I don't think anybody still believes in the Greek muses, right? But there's still use language that thinks that ideas are outside of you, then download into your brain, then go somewhere else, right? Even people that talk about feeling inspired, Right. People will say, oh, I didn't feel inspired, which is actually like derived from um, if you if you break the language, the word down to its origins, it, it means to be breathed upon as if the muses actually did breathe upon you and give you the idea. But then when you talk to people who are consistently um, creative or consistently producing creative work, they'll talk about the process. They'll talk about inspiration. And one of my favorite quotes, inspiration is for amateurs, Your professionals show up and work. Right. So they'll they'll talk about the grind, the process, doing the work. That's a different way of looking at it, um, and and that different way of looking at it makes a difference. And so I call these myths because myths, as we talked about earlier, are stories that we tell ourselves um, that that shape our worldview because they're an, they're an attempt to explain something mysterious when we don't have all of the information. And so if you think back to all of the myths of any society, they were usually an attempt to explain some weird thing about society or to reinforce some social norm. Uh, when they didn't have all of the information. So they concocted an elaborate story that sort of sounded good. And, and the more information you get about the world, the less and less and less those myths serve you. And so if you think about creativity, we have over five decades, if not more, psychological and neuroscience research on creativity, but we're still saying it just came to me, right? So clearly there are some myths, there are some stories we're telling ourselves that need to be rewritten. Um, and I take aim at 10 of them in the book. Um, why 10? They were actually 12, but two of them didn't really fit because I didn't know how to solve them. Right. Um, <clears throat> so I take aim at the 10 that I can say, here's the myth. Here are, uh, here's why it's a myth. Here's the psychology research that says what's wrong with the myth. And here are examples of people and companies who are doing it right. Right. And, and so we look at some of the most outstandingly creative companies, but only after we've looked at the psychology research, that said, here's how this is supposed to work. So there's there's 10 of them. I don't know that we want to spend uh, time going through each one. But as far as for entrepreneurs, for example, there's a lot of myths that I think are really damaging if you believe in them. One of probably the most prevalent is what I call the lone creator myth, this idea that prolifically creative people were um, – totally lonely people too. We think about Thomas Edison, we think about him alone in his workshop, slaving away at 10,000 or 5,000, or the Smithsonian says 600, so I'm going with 600 different filaments for a light bulb. In reality, Edison had a team of people working with him at all times. Uh, the most famous one was the team of what they called muckers at Menlo Park. And these were people who were always working uh, on various different projects, sometimes together, sometimes alone, sometimes with Edison, sometimes without Edison. The idea was that they were just always mucking about in each other's work. And out of that collaboration sprung all sorts of incredible – I mean the majority of, of Edison's really worthwhile patents came out of that period of time. And you can see their names on a lot of the patents that Edison has. He's not the only name on them. The muckers are also listed on those. And this is right in line with psychology research. Psychology research shows us creativity is a team sport. Innovation is a team sport. The more minds we have, 
functioning well, um, the better, right? But this is, if we think about Edison as a lone genius, then we're not, we're doing ourselves a disservice. Or, or modern day version would be someone like a Steve Jobs or, or Jack Dorsey, right? But Steve Jobs had Steve Wozniak and later Sir Johnny Ive, right? And Jack Dorsey, yeah, he founded Twitter and Square, but he founded Twitter with two other people and Square with two other people. There was a collaboration going on. So some, somewhere along the line, the people who make a dent in the world, we love to rewrite their history and make it look like they did it all by themselves, which is really damaging because when we're trying to make our dent in the world, if everybody is telling us that you have to go it alone and you end up needing help, you can feel like you're failing. You can feel like you have to give up. When in reality, everybody who ever made a significant enough impact in the world to have their collaborators forgotten had collaborators, right? And so we need to tell the story in a way that lets you know that if you have to partner with people, if you have to build a team of people, you are not failing. You are doing everything everyone important ever did. So, so um, that's one. I think one of the other more um, damaging ones as far as uh, entrepreneurship is concerned is the one that I close out the book with, which I call the mousetrap myth. And the term mousetrap comes from this, this phrase, if you build a better mousetrap, the world will beat a path to your door. Right. And this is an interesting phrase. It's one that's been fairly common. It's one we hear all the time. Although, interestingly, I can never find anyone who will fess up to have been to have said it first. You try and trace the origins of the quote and the people who get it attributed to. You can't find them admitting it in in publication. Um, Some iterations, but you can't find it perfect. And I think there's a good reason for that. Um, It's total rubbish. The, if you build a better mousetrap, the world doesn't beat a path to your door. If you if you build a better mousetrap, the world actually beats your idea down or, or even worse, ignores it, right? Uh, great ideas get rejected all of the time. And we like to joke about this now, but it's a, it's a real sort of issue, right? Um, Xerox invented uh, the personal computer and let Apple or Microsoft steal it away. They were still fighting over who stole it from who, but we know that they both stole it from Xerox to begin with. Um, Kodak invented the digital camera. They didn't see a a value in it because it wasn't based in film. They let Sony develop it all the way to Kodak's bankruptcy, right? Inside of um, inside of organizations, inside of large large organizations, this happens all the time. But it also happens for entrepreneurs. A lot of entrepreneurs who are sort of first to launch with a revolutionary idea find it initial resistance because psychologically we actually have sort of a a, a hidden bias against creative ideas. The, The way to the best way to think about it is. For an idea to be innovative, for it to be a disruptive innovation, the type of thing that will eventually turn into a groundbreaking uh, company or a company or product, it has to be new and useful at the same time. Right? If, you, if you ask 10 different people for definitions of creativity, uh, if, especially if you ask academics, you might actually get 11 answers because one of the academics will be citing somebody else's work. Um, so you, you get 10 or 11, but all of them will revolve around this word, uh, these words novel and useful. And what that really means is that we're, we're asking new ideas to depart from the status quo, to take us somewhere new, when at the same time, the metric that we're using to judge their value is all of our past experiences. That's the only, the only thing, the only, like big data, for example. Big data is only a statement on what we have in the past, right? Everything that we, everything that we can use to judge a new idea already happened. So we're simultaneously asking for something to take us away from the status quo, but we're going to use the status quo to judge whether or not it's useful. And that's really hard. And the research shows that especially in times of uncertainty, which if you think about entrepreneurship, it's like nothing but a time of uncertainty. But even if you just think about the normal economy with which entrepreneurs are launching businesses, this is a time of uncertainty. In times of uncertainty, we're more likely to say that we want creative ideas, but when we're presented with them, reject them in favor of sort of tried and true stuff that we know from the status quo. It's a a cognitive bias. It's something that we all uh, have. And so this can create a problem because as an entrepreneur, you can be launching your product, your, your product or service and facing some initial resistance and feel like that means your idea doesn't have merit. In reality, your idea may very well have merit. You're just – you're facing this sort of cognitive bias. And in, in reality, you're in really good company, right? If you have this groundbreaking idea and it really does have promise but you're having – you're struggling to get the world to see it, take heart and keep working because you're in the company of Xerox and you're in the company of uh, Kodak, right? Or I should say you're in the company of the personal computer, which was an idea that needed to leave Xerox to happen or the digital camera, which needed to leave Kodak to happen. Or In the book, I talk about um, CyberKnife, one of the most groundbreaking innovations and companies for treating cancer. It took 10 years to get off the ground because it took 10 years to get the medical community to see it. So – you're in really good company. And so to be to have your initial ideas sort of rejected because they depart from the status quo or appear to depart from the status quo too much, 
we can think that means the end of our entrepreneurial journey. And in reality, it means it's just the beginning. Things are about to get a lot better. Uh, the other thing that happens too is we, as at one, if we do it well enough to be successful as an entrepreneur, and now we're the leader of an organization, we still have the same bias that we fought against to get our organization launched. And so when our people present us new ideas, we're still afflicted by this same, but you'd think we'd learn our lesson, but that's the talking of biases. And so we're still afflicted with that. So when new people come with new ideas for improving it, it's really tempting to say, well, I started this company with this idea and this is working. And so we're going to keep doing it. When in reality, we're using, we're doing that same bias. We're, we're judging the new by the old and it's a damaging thing. So even though that we've made it, even though we're in a leadership position, we're still afflicted by, with that. And that needs to change. Most of the time when I go in to work with organizations, they come to me just like all of those books that come up with techniques for creative ideas. Most of the time they come to me and say, we need our people to have more great ideas. We need our people to generate more innovations. And I, I come back with the bad news that you know, the mousetrap myth suggests that innovation is not an idea generation problem. It's not if we can brainstorm better, we'll be a more innovative company. It's an idea recognition issue. Most organizations already have all of the ideas that they need inside of them or in their stakeholder community. They just need to get better at seeing those ideas. And that's a different issue. That's a, that's a worldview problem that needs to be fixed. So this is the premise. Those are two myths. There are eight others um, in, the, in the book, but it all begins with this premise that the stories that we're telling ourselves are true, even if they're not true. And there's a lot of stories about how creativity works, how innovation happens in, in big companies and in startups that need to be rewritten if we're really going to reach our innovation potential. That's huge. I love when we talk about the story. Another person who talks about that all the time is in all of his books or when he talks is, is Tony Robbins. He's always talking about um, you know, we, I can give you a book on finance. I can give you a book on, you know, creativity, all these different kinds of books, but, but the story that you tell yourself is something that's going to limit you. And so a lot of times he's helping people change their story. So, but thank you for taking us through the book and you went through a ton of phenomenal content. And so this next question I feel like is somewhat difficult. And then I'm asking that if the reader could only take away one concept, principle or action item, which this is probably based on, or for you might be, uh, maybe one myth that they could take away. Uh, out of your entire book, what would you want that to be? Yeah. So, um, yeah, let's go with myth. So I'll tell you, so the, num the number one would pro probably actually be that mousetrap myth, but I'll tell you the number two. And it's, so the mousetrap myth to me, I think afflicts businesses and organizations, but the one that I see the most often in people is what I call the Eureka myth, which is exactly that it just came to me idea, right? And we've all, we've all had these elated moments of like, ah, oh, I, I got my idea, these aha moments, right? Or um, what, what I love to joke about is if I, where do you get your best ideas? By the way, let me, let me just ask you, where do you get your best ideas? Um, sometimes shower, but mostly, mostly uh, when I'm doing cardio, mostly when okay. I'm working out. Okay. So you, so you said the magic word, right? Even though it's only sometimes shower, the most common thing I can have people say is the shower. I get my best ideas. It's actually the only time in a professional context, it's okay to talk about bathing. If you think about it, right? <laughs> um, no other time in our, in our life, or is it okay to talk about your shower with coworkers? But for that, for some reason, when it comes to ideas, we can talk about it. And it goes, I think it goes back all the way to the Archimedes and the bathtub story or the Newton and the Apple story. And the problem with that, I have a lot of those stories, like let's look at Newton and the apple, which by, I mean, this is a much bigger monologue. It probably never happened, but that's a different, a totally different monologue. But if, even if it did happen, you take the story of Newton and the apple and who is the protagonist? Who is the one doing the work? The apple, right? So if you, if you tell the story of Newton and the apple, what you're telling people is you want a great idea, sit under an apple tree and wait to get pegged in the head by a piece of fruit. Mm. Well, I, I don't have time for that, right? And that's not something I can replicate very often. I mean, I could replicate it often, but it's going to hurt. Uh, in, in reality, what's going on is there's a psychological um, idea around what we call incubation, that taking time off from work, taking time to switch tasks and focus on something else, there is some processing that goes on in the subconscious that really helps us generate more and better ideas. And the research says as little as five minutes switching tasks and looking at, at something different. When you go back to that task, you'll have more and better ideas. And so incubation is a very real thing, but incubation is step three, if you will, of a, of a five-stage process, or really it doesn't matter how many stages there are. The point is that incubation is in the middle. There's a lot of preparation that has to happen first, and even after you have the idea, there's a lot of evaluation and elaboration that has to happen after the idea. This is a broader process. You can't just sit back and wait. The people who say it just came from, it just came to me are most likely, when they need their next idea, just going to sit around and wait. 
the people who do prolifically creative work don't wait. Yes, they incubate, they take advantage of, and they have those aha moments, but it's part of a process that can be replicated. And that is a crucial difference if you're trying to be consistently creative, if you're trying to be prolifically innovative, if you're trying to build a business around innovation, which entrepreneurship is essentially innovation and marketing, right? If you're, if you're trying to build a business around innovation, you don't have time to wait to get pegged in the head by a piece of fruit. You need a process you can replicate. So I could have put a couple of quotes out of that right there. And that actually leads <laughs> to our next question, which is, do you have a favorite quote from your book? Um, so I'll give you, I'll give you two. Uh, and and I, I'm going to plagiarize uh, because I can't promise that they came from me. I'm sure somebody said the exact phrase before me, but and that's actually the nature of, of ideas in general. If you, if you think you've had a wholly original idea, chances are somebody else had it before you. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the first would be what we were talking about with the lone creator myth, uh, that creativity is a team sport The creativity is a team sport. And then the other is that we tend to think that constraints, resources, budgets, uh, timelines, all, all of those sort of constraints actually hinder us in reality. Creativity thrives under constraints. It doesn't, it doesn't just sort of love constraints or doesn't just deal with constraints. It thrives under constraints. It, it, the research supports that people actually think better when they're constrained uh, as far as creativity and that great, better ideas come out of more constraints because constraints help us understand the limitations and help us structure the problem, help us structure the question. And not to quote Tony Robbins, but if you want a better answer, get a better question, mm. right? Constraints yeah. help us figure out the question. So creativity thrives under constraints. So David, I'm excited about this next question because there's no doubt that your book is going to be a, a paradigm shifter for a lot of people. I mean, even just, I mean, the myths, myths are obviously, then then you're breaking those down. And a lot of us are going to believe in these myths uh, until we read what you have to say. And then you're, so what you're doing is, is creating a paradigm shift for a lot of us. And that's my next question is what's a book that you've read that's had a huge impact on your life and, and created a paradigm shift. So um, I'm going to give you a little bit different answer, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, there's, I mean, because there, there's, a, there's a lot of those. There's a, a ton of those. Some of them are business books. Other of those are religious books, et cetera. But I'll tell you one that I'm in the, the process of shifting on, if, if you will. Mm-hmm. I've been chewing on – there's a book called The Opposable Mind by Roger Martin. Roger Martin was the dean of the Rotman School of Management at University of Toronto for a long time. He, was, he worked with Michael Porter's um, strategy consulting group for a long time. And he has this book called The, the Opposable Mind mind. And what he says is that creative leaders, innovative leaders, people who make an impact in in the world are able to look at two conflicting or contrasting models of the world at the same time and figure out where the benefits are of them and and, um, achieve essentially what seems impossible because either one model or the other would say that what you're trying to do is impossible. When you take the two sort of contrasting ways of looking at the world together, uh, you're able to do that. And and this is really, um, this is the beginning of what he calls, um, th- this book was the beginning of his exploration into what he calls abductive logic, abductive reasoning. And that shapes design thinking. His follow-up book after this was The Design of Business, which everybody heralds as sort of the beginning of design thinking as a, as a, as a field. Um, but The Opposable Mind came before that. And it's interesting because the reason I'm chewing on it so much is that he gives a bunch of wonderful examples. Like, for example, the Four Seasons is two opposing models. It's a luxury hotel brand that doesn't try and feel opulent and gaudy and big and marble, you know, floors and all that. It tries to make you feel at home. So it's it's a homey feel, but a luxury brand that seems impossible, but yet they're able to do it. And it's really it's cool to read the stories. Um, after the fact and go, yeah, these are two seemingly opposing models that can be reconciled. But what it challenges you to do, the reason I'm still chewing on is that it challenges you to figure out like, okay, well, what models of the world do I have that I need to think more abductively over and all that sort of thing. So, I mean, I read it first, probably 18 months ago, the second time, maybe 10 months ago, and I'm still sort of chewing on this idea. So it's, it continues to impact my life. The Opposable Mind um, by Roger Martin. Roger's an intellectual hero of mine. And this is, I think, turning into one of my favorite of his books. Does he talk about politics in there at, at all? I mean, it seems like we, when you first yeah, say I mean, that, no. you to describe it, it makes me think that yeah. we'd we might be better off if politicians would kind of take that 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 respect. Yeah, totally. I mean, no, no, he doesn't get into it because he, he he writes from strictly a business standpoint. But but yeah, no, I totally agree with you. And if you think about the politicians that actually like here's here's something we never think about, right? In, in politics in the United States, here's something we never think about. Opposable mind wise, gridlock is actually a good thing. 
right now gridlock gridlock that results in like shutting down the government because we can't agree on a budget that's that's probably dysfunction but the system was actually designed such that opposing preferences on how a bill gets structured are a good thing because the end result means that only good stuff gets passed. If you look at either party, it doesn't matter which one. If you look at, at laws that we ended up regretting in the long run, they usually happened when we had a majority in both in both houses and that person in the president. They usually happen when it could be like sort of forced through. Right. In reality, the laws over a long I mean I'm talking about over a 10 year process, gridlock and friction and tension actually become a good thing. Right. Uh, and that's a really hard thing to to say to, to have any one person on any one party to say because your success in the party depends on your not be, uh, and to be able to point across the aisle and go, you're wrong 100% of the time. And in reality, I mean, there's some rightness in both parties, wrongness and wrongness in their rightness. Right? And it's the people and the the groups of people that are able to reach across, we say reach across the aisle, if you will, but um, it's the people that are able to reconcile all those two things that actually make a lasting impact in governance, for example. So he doesn't go into it, but yeah, that's definitely one area where it totally applies. Excellent. So David, before we depart, Thank you for that recommendation, by the way, that I love uh, ones that are kind of outside the realm or outside. Not that I, I mind hearing Think and Grow Rich and and uh, uh, some of the classics that we hear over and over again because they're phenomenal, but I, but I like adding to my book list as well, and I have not read that one. So, Dave, though, before we depart, can you recommend the best way for our listeners to not only get more information on you, but also your book, The Myths of Creativity? Yeah, I mean, I, so I was blessed. I have um, a really weird name as far as last name Burkus B U R K U S I've I've met a few people that that I'm not related to that share the same last name um nobody that shares like the exact name although I'm sure you're out there so if you are I mean let me know let's have a party um <laughs> but so if you type that into Google David B U R K U S Burkus uh you'll find me right off the bat I I would encourage you like I mean you'll find the book on Amazon all that sort of stuff but I I would actually encourage people go to the um go to the website and there's a page called free resources I have a ton of free stuff um, about the book. So workbooks with, you guessed it, activities, um, but workbooks, but also keynotes that I've given that delve into different myths that we didn't delve in here, et cetera. Interviews with some of the people, longer interviews with some of the people that I interviewed in the book, all sorts of stuff that's totally free. So chew, chew on that first and use that to help use this podcast, but also use some of those resources to help you decide whether or not to buy the book. And if you do buy the book, I, I hope that you do. And getting those resources will also get you um, plugged into me. Let me send you some updates and give you, I mean, you'll get my contact information right off of that. You can connect with me on whatever social network you want or email or whatever. Um, so let me know any questions you have. Because I said earlier, a book is never finished. It's just published. And so mm-hmm. I'd love for you to, to get the book and to chew on some of those resources and let me know how they affected you to help me continue to shape this idea. Perfect. David, thank you so much for coming on. And like I said you know, at the beginning when you referenced it, thank you for coming on and sharing your book, your baby with us. Oh, yeah. Thank, thank you for having me so much. It's so good. I like showing them off, right? I'm a proud parent. So there you go. <laughs> Thanks again for listening in today. If you'd like more information on David or his book, The Myths of Creativity, just check out the show notes at the elpodcast.com. Looking for your next book idea? Head over to the elpodcast.com, where Wade shares his amazing resource, the top 10 business books recommended by over 500 entrepreneurs with you for free. That's the elpodcast.com. Till the next time, keep it on the EL.